Okay, now let's talk about social cognition today. Now, what is social cognition? All right, so before we start to uh, dive in, in into this big question, let's talk about what animals are doing. Okay, so what we know is that animals are social in nature, and most of our actions are really socially oriented. And then because when you kind of think about it, you are not alone in this world. And on top of that, and the way that you kind of define yourself, a lot of it is coming from the way that you interact with another person and with another uh, animal. And now one of the things with humans is that uh, we have far superior social abilities compared to other um, mammals. And even like other social um, animals such as rats or uh, other primates that are very uh, social, but you, you, you'll see that uh, humans are far more superior compared to that. And this is uh, one of the reasons why we have um, language is for us to better communicate our current thoughts to another person. Now think about it, if we're not being very social, there is no reason to develop a set of rules that um, utter very well meaning exactly what you're trying to say that's going inside your head. And that's because you have, uh, we as humans have this compelling need to share our feelings or our thoughts with another fellow human being, okay? Now, one of the things that we know about the social environment is that if you were to enrich them, if you are in, to enrich our social environment, this can lead to many benefits in brain functioning. Now, um, on the other hand, if, uh, if there are some sort of uh, social depri uh, deprivation or as what we're going through now with the COVID-19, when there's some, some sort of social distancing, this can really have some great impact on our brain functioning. And especially when it comes to the prefrontal areas. But you will see that the social aspect does not only impact the prefrontal areas, but there's multiple aspects it will actually focus on, uh, it, will, it will also impact on later. So, uh, but today's lecture, we're gonna focus a lot of it into the prefrontal areas because this is where a lot of the research has been showing basically recently. Now let's take a look at what happens to uh, social deprivation and how that can actually um, have an impact on the dendritic banding. Okay. Now they were looking at layer three parameter neurons in the orbital frontal cortex, which is a part of the prefrontal cortex. Now they're doing this in rats because obviously you can't do this in humans. So they sent the, they uh, socially deprived the, the rat when they were growing up uh, during puberty. So because this is the, uh, the time when um, the effect of social deprivation has the maximum amount of effect impact on the social behavior in rats. So they did this during the puberty and then they're looking at something called the dendritic pruning process. Okay, now what is dendritic pruning? Now, you might not know this, but um, dendritic pruning is basically a process where when an animal or a person is growing up and there is an initial elaboration of the dendritic field with the dendritic um, fanning patterns, okay? And then after that, after um, we and after after this initial starting of the fanning prop, uh, properties, there is a certain amount of refinement. So what you so the refinement uh, refinement meaning basically the the, the dendrites start to prune away, and then they start to kind of um, take away the processes that is not needed for the neuron because the neurons has this uh, innate ability to pretty much conserve the the useful processes and tr trim away the ones that are not necessary okay and so and same thing you see this a lot in sensory enrichment and sensory deprivation literatures okay now so in this study what they're looking at is whether or not 
uh, social deprivation uh, has an impact on that. So their hypothesis was that um, if there is not that much um, peer play, okay, so playing with the peers, uh, which means some sort of social stimulation, if the animals are not going through some sort of social stimulation, then the refinement of the dendrite with the dendritic field that uh, a, a, a rat would normally go through would be pretty much stunted. Okay, so that's the hypothesis. So, and do their results kind of uh, match that? Well, yes, they do. Um, because when, when you kind of look at what is going on, uh, what you're seeing is that there is, um, they're looking at the total, thin, um, uh, total dendritic branch order, which is an indicator of how, thin, uh, how elaborate the dendrite is, okay? And then what you're seeing is that the animals that went through no peer play over here, so this is uh, the socially deprived group, compared to ones that went through a single peer play or the ones that went through uh, the multiple peer play, what you are basically seeing is that their dendritic fanning in the no peer play group is significantly higher compared to the two other groups. Okay, so what does this mean? Well, this means that the dendritic pruning during development, uh, if the, the animals are getting no social stimulation or not enough amount of social stimulation, we can kind of, we should put it like that, then this uh, dendritic pruning process is decreased, okay? So that's kind of think about what the orbital frontal cortex do in humans. So we already know that um, depriving an animal of its social uh, stimulation can really have an effect on the development of the orbital frontal cortex. So what does the orbital frontal cortex do? Now, before I tell you the answer, we should first take a look at uh, one of the most famous case uh, to what happens to a person without a proper functioning orbital frontal cortex, okay? And that is the case of Phineas Gage, okay? So Phineas Gage, in case that you uh, don't know who he is, um, basically Phineas Gage is a person who is a rail, rail, uh, railway, railroad worker, okay? And back in the 1840s, I think, uh, he was setting up controlled explosions to blast through like rocks. And then by mistake, basically, there is some, some sort of um, uh, pipe that went through basically what you see there, you know, that went through his orbital frontal cortex. Okay. And then now, now miraculously, miraculously, he remained conscious and basically alert throughout the incident. And you'll see that, you know, the damage to the brain area really is not that extensive throughout the entire brain, but then mostly, uh, it mostly kind of uh, limited to the orbital frontal cortex. So you see that the areas of the brain that um, the pipe went through is basically kind of damaging the orbital frontal cortex uh, only. Okay, now he remained um, alive uh, after this accident. And, but then afterwards, there was like a lot of changes in his personality, okay? So for instance, for instance, before uh, Phineas was a, well, he has been a very well-respected citizen. So he's basically like the model citizen, what you would want. And he is like a, a exemplary worker and he's very well-liked man. And, but after his injury, his friends said that he was no longer the person that they, they knew him. Like he basically there is like a huge personality change, right? And then his personality change uh, included 
um, things like he started to swear a lot and then he would use like um, uh, he would uh, engage in like a, a really some really gross uh, profanity and then which is not how, how he was before right and then he would have like you no know, impulse control and before he was courteous and then um, but after uh, this incident where his uh, brain is damaged basically and then he had a lot of uh, impulsivity control problems he is very irritable and then he get angry uh, very fast uh, very very angry also and and which it, none of this uh, is consistent with what he the person that he was um, before the incident so one of the things that you would kind of think about what this kind of really mean is that what uh, Phineas Gage is really suffering through is the lesions to their uh, to his frontal lobe that resulted in a change in his social behavior. And now, what does this suggest? Well, that actually suggests that this brain region is involved with social cognition, and not just social cognition, but also personality. Uh, uh, kind of have a tremendous amount of personality makeup in them. And as you can see that a lesioning of this area, the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, uh, specifically orbital frontal cortex, um, that really had a, a huge issue when it comes to uh, changing Phineas Gage's personality. So this is one of the first examples of one of the first clinical cases that really started to pinpoint that this area um, maybe not solely responsible, but definitely plays a very important role when it comes to a, a person's personality makeup. So the damage to the orbital frontal cortex, uh, as you can see that um, that really is going to impair sensory integration. It's going to decrease their emotional inhibition. Uh, this is why um, Gage had um, impulsivity control problems. And then it's also going to decrease decision-making abilities with regard to reward and punishment. This is something that we've talked about in the previous two lectures also, okay? And a lot of that you're gonna see that is going to be a great shape Sorry, uh, in a great change in uh, aggression and personality. Now, that's begin with this concept of self part. In, you know, because when we kind of think about it, the social cognition aspect is really how you interact with another person, right? So, so there is the part of you and there is the part of um, another person that is reflected back on the way that you perceive of that person. So there is a, this dyad um, that is going on when it comes to this social environment. So there is uh, your self-referencing and there is your reference of another person and your relationship with that. Right. So let's begin with the self part with the social diet. So now one of the things when you kind of think about that, uh, the self appears to be not just governed by one place. Okay, when you kind of think about that, it is made up with separable processes full of uh, separable content, content from a vast supply of sources coming from within and without the brain and the body. So now the regions that we are really looking at is um, um, places like the prefrontal cortex. Right now, when the prefrontal cortex really uh, the part of it that when you when we are should really look at is the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, the ventral uh, the, the ventral prefrontal cortex, and the orbital uh, frontal cortex. Right now, so that's some uh, that's, that's something that you can see on um, the lateral side and now on the medial side the places you can see are the anterior cingular cortex that we have talked about last time and then now the ventral medial prefrontal cortex is also uh this part that when you kind of uh we we have also uh briefly touched upon okay so now outside of the prefrontal cortices are the other places 
and when you kind of think about it, these are going to be the cingulate cortex, uh, the posterior part of it, and also the medial parietal cortices. Now, these are the areas that has a more important aspect when it comes to the default state, um, which really kind of means that when you're kind of relaxing and doing not that much, and then your sense of self is really um, increased, and you'll see that there are a lot of areas, um, they, they call this the central medial network. Um, so these are the areas including uh, the anterior cingulate cortex, the posterior cingulate cortex, and the medial parietal cortex. And this place uh, we're not really seeing is retro, uh, the retrosplenial cortex. These are the places that are really um, involved in this uh, what we call the default state um, because when you are in uh, when you, your sense of self uh, is really decreased uh, is, is increased you see that this area of the brain also come accordingly uh, simultaneously increase as well okay so we believe that these areas this central medial uh, cortical areas are important for the sense of self now let's talk about the idea of yourself. Okay, so th this is the self perception and self knowledge. Now, so this is basically how do we get to know ourselves, and and with that you can kind of get an idea how do we get to know others. So this is basically has to do with uh, Socrates' imperative, uh, right? So know thyself. And so one of the things, uh, well, so how exactly do we do that? We basically develop our self-knowledge through self-perception process designed to uh, gather information about the self, okay? And so basically there are usually a set of questions you can kind of ask yourself in when it comes to the typical self-referential processing aspect. Okay, and then so there are usually a bunch of questions you can ask yourself and then to see if you meet that criteria or if that can kind of come through like some sort of checklist. All right. So what is self-referential processing? Uh, well, Craig and Lachar found that uh, the information process is more meaningful manner and, and that is going to be remembered better than if information is um, um, processed in a more superficial manner. This is back then in the idea, okay? Now, when you kind of think about it, the, what is the deepest process that you can go? Well, it's when something is personally related to you, right? So then what happened is that this idea of, um, Deep versus superficial, uh, deep versus superficial processing is later on extended, and was found that when a person refer an idea to himself, then he remembers and understands them much better than if he is talking it as if it happened to another person. So what you can see here, this is a typical self-referential processing experiment. So the participants will answer a series of questions about their own personality traits, as well as the personality trait of, let's say, someone else. Right? And when they are asked to kind of ask which traits that they can remember. So this is, um, so when it comes to the self-referential uh, referential effect, basically what we are doing, uh, well not we, but what, what the, the subject is doing is kind of trying to really try to see what is what what uh, traits what personality traits fit with uh, your view of yourself okay and also what your view against um, someone else in this case maybe like the president of the united states so what you can do is then you can kind of compare um the you can remember the target words better if the process uh, in, it's, it's, it's regarded to you and less uh, when it's regarded to other people, okay, in this case, the president. 
Now, are there anything that's unique about the brain when it comes to the participants making the judgment in the self condition? Well, there is. So as we said before, the medial prefrontal cortex uh, areas are are pretty much are going to be more differentially activated when a person is kind of referring these personality traits to themselves uh, compared to the other conditions when, when they are trying to describe other people, in other words, okay? So now later the studies basically found that the level of activity in the medial prefrontal cortex predicted which items would be um, remember on a surprise memory test, okay? And then what happened is that you can see that the relationship between the medial prefrontal cortex and the self-reference also extends to the instance when the participants have to view themselves through another person's eyes, okay? So basically what we're seeing, you can see that this area, that um, here that's being circled right now, that is the medial prefrontal cortex, okay? And and you can see that uh, that the signal change, so, I, so this is the both signal changes uh, in the fMRI, and you can see that well, when it comes to um, the self versus um, the other, other two conditions compared to the other and also that the printed format, you can see that the amount of the bold change is uh, differentially activated, okay, compared to the other two conditions. Now, one of the things I kind of wanted to touch upon is, is there a, a form uh, or a state when you're kind of not doing anything, what is your brain doing in in maintenance of that? Or, and on top of that, when we kind of think about everything that we have looked so far uh, throughout the semester, and when it comes to the fMRI studies, uh, what the participants are really doing is they are, uh, they are doing some sort of task to be to, to perform, right? So they're performing some sort of cognitive task. So typically they are asked to rest between tasks. Now imagine yourself kind of lying in a magnet with nothing to do. And now does your, what does your mind do? Does it, does it kind of turn off like a TV screen? Um, no, I mean, you start to think about what you have to do like later after you're done with this task where you're thinking about what do I have to do later today? What am I eating today? So all of these aspects when it comes to um, this referencing, uh, self-referential part of you that uh, when you start to think about you and also when kind of planning about what you are about to do later, all of these are a self-referential part as kind of sort of baseline modes of brain function. Now, so therefore, is there are, are, are there areas in the brain that are associated with these default states, so, uh, so to speak? Okay, now there are. So you see that uh, there are brain areas that kind of represent, quote unquote, the self. Now, when you are resting, basically your brain does not just get shut off, right? And so uh, these people, um, uh, Rachel and, and Gushna and their colleagues basically argue that when you are at rest, uh, your brain does not just shut off, right, obviously. And then what happened is that it continues to engage but revert to a number of um, cognitive or psychological processes that describe as the uh, default network of brain function, okay? so. Where are these default network um, being engaged to? So everything that you're seeing here is the brain areas that are postulated to involve in the default network. And you can see that a lot of it is really the central medial uh, cortical networks. So we see that there is uh, the dorsal medial cortex, right? And then there is the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, and there's also the posterior medial cortex. And on top of that, there are places uh, that say 
um, this area called the precuneus. And then there are also the inferior parietal lobule and the temporal parietal junction. And now laterally, there are also the areas such as the lateral temporal cortex. So you can see that these are uh, the network that are more recruited or kind of really associate with this um, stronger engagement when a person is in its default state. Now, what happens when a person is doing uh, activities? Uh, or, I mean, not activity, but are involved in some sort of cognitive task. So, in in the sense, kind of exerting their uh, cognitive activities to some sort of task at hand. Then what happens is that these default network then gets more deactivated when it comes to uh, when the person is engaging in some sort of cognitive task. And so in this sense, you kind of lose your quote unquote lose yourself when you are um, really engaged in some sort of cognitive task that is really uh, needs to involve uh, these other brain areas that are being uh, activated. Okay. Now let's talk about self perception as a motiv uh, motivated process. Now one of the things that your textbook brought up is very that I thought was very interesting is that most people really thought that they are better than um, than how other people see them, okay? And then, and a lot of them have a, um, often have an unrealistic and positive self-perceptions. So when you kind of look at the data, the high school uh, students, 70% rank themselves above average in leadership abilities. Right, and then while ninety three percent of college professors believe that they are doing better than other professors that's out there, right, and now more than fifty percent of people believe that they are above average when it comes to their how smart they are and how uh, physically attractive they are, and a whole host of other positive characteristics. So you can see that there is uh, this human inclinations that. Uh, kind of viewing themselves from rose-colored glasses. And you can see that they tend to believe that they are more likely than others to experience positive uh, future events, something like they are guaranteed that we should have like a good life and, and, and so to speak. So you can see that, uh, and they're, they're also less likely to than others to experience negative future events. Now, let's take a look at the neural activities in relationships to judging positive information about yourself versus like other people and also the negative aspect when it comes to yourself and other people. Okay, and you can see that there are less activation in this area, uh, the anterior cingulate cortex, uh, specifically in the ventral anterior cingulate cortex. Uh, and, and you can see that Basically, this is really associated with the rating positive personality traits in comparison to negative personality traits. Okay, so you can, uh, so basically this differences here, this, this difference here is this highly self-relevant positive traits cause much less signal decrease in the ventral ACC rather than the high Self, um, high self relevant negative traits. So this kind of tells us that uh, the role of the ventral ACC is responsible for focusing attention on positive information about ourselves compared to negative information. And there is also less activation in positive traits and more activation in negative traits about ourselves, okay? Okay, so that was the self. Now let's talk about how do we learn other people. So in other words, how do we understand what kind of from inference or from uh, referencing to how you have felt before, how do we kind of infer what another person is feeling? 
also, okay? So this is the idea of the theory of mind. So this is the ability to infer our mental state to another because most likely we as human, um, when you go through life and the more life experiences that you gain, you know how certain uh, information with certain experiences can make you feel, okay? Now, if you really don't know that, you can kind of watch another person's uh, feeling of that and you can kind of empathetically try to understand um, just through uh, watching another person happen to, uh, the thing happen to another person, what thing happened to you, you kind of infer what happened to uh, what what this person is uh, going through. So this is the ability to relate to another person's feeling or thought patterns. Is this always correct? Uh, no, because you know you are not. You don't have a probe in their brain, and you and you can really you're not them. You're not living in another person's body, so you don't really know how they are exactly feeling. But there, you can. But uh, based on what uh, life experiences you've had, you can still kind of relate to another person. Um, especially if these are the feelings that you have previously experienced before, okay? Now, there are a significant amount of the, the medial prefrontal lobe and making inferences to others. And so when you kind of think about what is going on when it comes to the way that you, when you meet a person, how do you kind of judge them by what their actions are? Well, when you kind of think about them, you really do, okay? And when, when you met, uh, meet a person in the first time, there might be something that he or she is doing or is not doing that really gave you an impression of them. So while there is, well, in this case, then what, where in the brain is responsible for this, right? Now, let's take a look at this study about personality inference, okay? Now, so the participants were presented with a series of pictures that pair faces with statements about personality. And what happened they have to do is that uh, the participants were instructed either to make an inference about a person's personality or to pay attention to the order in which the statements were presented. All right, so, uh, so for instance, A here, you know, you're looking at this person's face and you can say that at the party, he was the first to start dancing on the table, okay? And then on the right, you know, this person's face and he refused to lend his extra blanket to another, uh, to, to the other campers, okay? So, and B, what you are seeing is these are the medial prefrontal cortex activities that were associated with form, uh, forming the impression of personality in comparison to remembering the sequence order. Okay, so you can see that uh, what the, so this is what basically what B is showing you, and they're looking at this area. Uh, you can see that this is uh, the, the anterior cingulate cortex that's being really activated over there, and the. Uh, and when it compared to the sequence, you don't see that there is, you know, it's kind of hovering around uh, close to the baseline. But compared to the ones uh, following the personality statement, you can see that the personality statement when a person is making an inference to another person's social uh, outcomes or social, when you're kind of trying to make a judgment socially about another person, then what happened is that this, uh, area in the brain, the anterior cingulate cortex, is much more active um, during when you are making uh, an inference about a person's personality. Now, let's talk about the theory of mind. So this is the ability to impute mental states to oneself and another person, basically, okay? Now, these are important for social development and interactions. So these are important for capacity to co uh, cooperate and empathize and uh, anticipate the behavior of others. And we're actually pretty good at doing this, okay, uh, as human beings. 
And these are going to be innate uh, and automatic. So this is not something that is learned. Now, there are two theories that are um, basically kind of trying to explain the theory of mind. So there is the experience sharing theory is also known as the uh, simulation theory. And there is the mental state attribution theory, which is also known as the theory theory. Now, much of the behavior work on theory of mind has uh, examined this ability to develop over a person's lifespan. So, uh, so one of the things uh, this Sally Ann false belief task is very interesting in determining the presence or absence of theory of mind. So uh, let's take a look at what it is. Okay, so up here you have Sally that place uh, that places her marble in the basket, and then the Sally then leaves, and then Anne transfers uh, Sally's marble to the drawer, and the Sally re-enters, right? And then where does Sally look for the marble? Now, so you can kind of infer that you know you can kind of put yourself in Sally's shoes and you can say that. Well, Sally originally placed her marble in the basket and she doesn't know that Anne moved her marble, then therefore uh, Sally must be looking for her marble in the basket. Right? So, so this is the task they use with children to determine, to determine whether they can interpret what Sally is thinking about the location of the marble. So because Sally does not see Anne move the the marble from the basket, then she, she should be expected to look for the marble in the basket. Okay, so you can see that the children, um, they do not reliably pass this test until they are about four years old. And then, then suddenly it dawns on them, um, basically after that they can just start to do that very well. But you can see that uh, this task is a little bit too difficult to younger children and that's more of than like just the false belief task. So basically um, you can kind of kind of think about it as the way that uh, because when we kind of think about what the prefrontal cortex um, develop is that uh, that gets developed latest. Now, let's take a look at what happens when the brain areas that's responsible for social cognitive behavior that cannot properly function. And the hallmark disease that has a developmental flavor when you kind of think about it is really is um, the autism spectrum disorders. And these includes just autism or Asperger's uh, where childhood disintegrative disorder and pervasive developmental disorders not otherwise specified. Now, there are a lot of different views when it comes to the etiologies of the autism spectrum disorder, so we won't talk too much about it, but basically now we have a pretty good understanding of what the combination of, the, of genetic accessibility and exposure to an um, exogenous risk at developmentally critical areas that can really kind of explain this um, heterogeneity of uh, autism spectrum disorders when it comes to this underlying um, pathology, uh, pathology in, in abnormal stem cell proliferation followed by some sort of abnormal neuronal migration. So we'll just kind of uh, stay there because uh, if you want to go really very in deep there, this, this is definitely can be a, a neurodevelopmental class, which is not, which is beyond the scope of this course. But something that we do know is the anatomical and the connectivity differences in aut autism spectrum disorder patients. And here what you're uh, showing, what you're seeing here is, um, this is the fractional anisotropy kind of reveals that there is difference in white matter connectivity between the individuals with um, autism spectrum disorders and uh, other uh, typical control. And so what happens is that when the researchers compare the white matter network of um, uh, um, 
ASD patients, um, mostly males, and then other controls that kind of show that there is some sort of uh, track-based uh, spatial statistics. And uh, what they're basically doing is they're doing some sort of voxel by voxel analysis and looking at uh, the, 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 the difference when it comes to the diffuser tensor imaging fMRI data, and, and which is a, 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 a comparison between how much water differences of when it's folding, okay? Now, comparing to the controls, the autism spectrum disorder group has significantly lower fractional anisotropy. Basically, is the relative degree of the anisotropy in voxels in the left arcuate fasciculus arc. Okay, the external capsule, the anterior and posterior cingulum, and anterior cingulate cortex. But also, basically, a bunch of these areas that you are seeing. Okay, now there are there are no increases in fractional anisotropy in the autism spectrum disorder group compared to controls. So uh, here, what you're seeing that the numbered green lines on the head are upper left indicates the location of the, uh, of basically like the, the same numbered scans. Okay, and the red regions, what are you seeing is these are these, um, the reduced, number of in terms with the anisotropy um, values compared uh, in the uh, autism spectrum disorder groups. All right. And so basically what you're seeing that um, there is no increases in anisotropy in the LS, uh, in the um, uh, ASD group compared with controls. So the next thing they wanted to do is to take a look at the group whole brain analysis of functional activities between controls and the autism spectrum disorder patients. So the color bar, what you're seeing here, these are the activations. So these are the positive P values. And then what essentially what you're seeing is that um, the warmer colors indicate um, more activations and the, the, the colder colors indicates a uh, deactivation, okay? And now for the control patients, basically what you're seeing is that there are large regions of deactivation in the medial prefrontal cortex and the right and singular, uh, the right and singular, uh, the right anterior singular cortex, okay? And also there are, you can see that the, uh, the places uh, such as the precuneus and also the posterior singular cortex are all, uh, increasingly deactivated, okay? And also you see um, medial prefrontal cortex and also the right anterior cingulate cortex. All of these are um, decreasingly activated or increasingly deactivated, okay? So basically you see less activities, okay? But when you look at the, uh, the autism spectrum disorder patient, you don't see that such thing, okay? So, so, uh, so when you kind of look at these, uh, so all of these black outlines that you are seeing uh, in C, the, these, are, these are basically control versus um, the ASDs. And you can, you can basically have a good idea that uh, this is a direct uh, group comparison between the controls and the autism uh, spectrum disorder participants reveal that um, there is a significant activation difference when it comes to uh, the medial prefrontal cortex and all of these areas that we mentioned uh, that's basically circled on this slide. Okay, um, okay, I think that's it about this slide. Now, one of the things that is actually very hot in the debates when it comes to the social mirroring aspect of the autism spectrum disorder patients. This is basically, um, if you remember going back to your visual as well as your motor planning lectures, there are these things called the mirror neurons in the pre-motor areas, right? And so, and so this kind of 
gets an idea that whether or not the autism spectrum disorder patients, uh, whether their motor intentions and their old motor plannings are also defective. Okay, now, so, so basically here what they are doing is they're investigating the understanding of the motor intentions when it comes to the autism spectrum disorder patients. Okay, so, uh, so basically what you're seeing is that, so they designed it, uh, two tasks. So in the task number one that you're seeing in A, this is the, the participants where the experimenter reaches for a piece of food, grasps it, and then puts it in his mouth. Okay, and now in the second task where you see in B, the participants where the experimenter reaches for a piece of paper, grasps it, and puts it in a container on his shoulder. And so you can see that these are rather uh, somewhat unusual uh, aspect when it comes to uh, the motor planning because usually you don't have a cup on your shoulders, right? And let's take a look at how this would actually um, uh, differ when, when you look at uh, the patients uh, comparing the, the, the ASD children versus um, uh, typically developed children, okay? So this is what they're basically showing you when it comes to the reach actions, okay? So so these so this is the reach that this is the time course of the muscle activities that's going on, okay? And so in the red, what you're seeing is this is the this is the task number one, and then in the blue, this is task number two, okay? Um, task number one is the to to put the food in the mouth, and then the task number two is to place a piece of paper on the shoulder cup, as you can remember. And what A is showing you, this is the action executed by the normal, uh, typically developing children. You can see that uh, how that compares to B on the lower bottom. And you can see that their muscle activities are not exactly the same, especially when it comes to um, the disparities between the reach and the grasp and the bring into the mouth, you can see that there is a significant amount of disparities at this level, okay? Okay, also in the reach level, you see some uh, disparities, okay? And then so, so that is, um, so, so A and B is basically when they are showing you the action that's being executed by both the autism spectrum disorder children as well as the typically developed children. Now let's take a look at C and D. This is action that is observed by uh, both set of children. And, and, and they're looking at uh, the rectified EMG to the observable actions basically. Okay, and then so what you're uh, basically seeing is there is a significant disparities be, uh, when you look at the eat versus the place in the typically developed children, but not when it comes to the autism spectrum disorder children. Okay, so what you can kind of uh, uh, appreciate is that there is a significant amount of disparity here in typical developed children, but not so much in the autism spectrum disorder children. So what does that mean? What that means that when something is kind of socially inadequate or socially abnormal, um, because uh, you don't usually put something like a piece of paper in your um, the shoulder that's on your cup, uh, that, that a cup that's on your shoulder, right? So you can see that the autism uh, the autism spectrum disorder children, um, they uh, in both observing part as well as the execution part when it comes to the motor interaction with um, something in, in the development, this is, they have some real issues when it comes to them, okay? So this evidence suggests that the individual motor acts are not kind of integrated into an action chain in, in, in autism spectrum disorder children, uh, so they lack the full comprehension of the intention of others. Okay, I'll say that again. Okay, so this evidence suggests that the individual motor acts are not integrated into the action chain in autism spectrum disorder children, so they lack full comprehension of the intention of others. So in other words, this is why they cannot uh, really understand what is going on 
when a person is trying to socially cue them because they don't full, they cannot fully grasp that idea. Okay, so that's basically uh, the issues when it comes to the autism children. Now, the last thing that we're going to talk about is that remember that next week your report, your article reading report is due. Uh, if in an unlikely event that you have, you still have not get your article approved, please do because um, if you don't, you don't know what I'm expecting and you will not get a good grade. Okay. Now, the next lecture we're going to talk about is going to uh, talk about stress. And so we'll go over how stress really impact um, the body as well as the mind. Well, we're going to focus more on how that impacts on the brain. It should be a very interesting lecture because this is something that um, I do my research on. Okay.